The Pastoral Epistles Introduction The pastoral epistles have played an important part in the history of the Christian Church and have amply justified their inclusion in the New Testament canon. Their appeal lies in their blend of sound practical advice and theological statement, which has proved invaluable to Christians both personally and collectively. Donald Guthrie 1. The Meaning of the Term Pastoral Epistles Since the 1700s, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus have been called the Pastoral Epistles. The description may be misleading or helpful, depending on how one understands it. If the designation suggests that the letters contain practical suggestions on how to care for the sheep of the Lord, then it has served its purpose well. However, if it suggests that Timothy and Titus were settled clergymen, modern pastors, of the churches in Ephesus and Crete, respectively, then you have been misled. Older editions of the King James Bible contain uninspired subscripts at the end of the epistles which have lent credence to this historical error. For instance, at the end of 2 Timothy is this non-inspired edition. The second epistle unto Timotheus, ordained the first bishop of the Church of the Ephesians, was written from Rome, when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. And at the end of Titus is this explanation. It was written to Titus, ordained the first bishop of the Church of the Cretans, from Nicopolis of Macedonia. Albert Barnes, himself a clergyman, can scarcely be charged with prejudice when he comments. There is no evidence that Titus was the first bishop of the church there, or that he was the first one there to whom might be properly applied the term bishop in the scriptural sense. Indeed, there is positive evidence that he was not the first, for Paul was there with him, and Titus was left there to complete what he had begun. There is no evidence that Titus was bishop there at all in the prelatical sense of the term, or even that he was a settled pastor. These subscriptions are so utterly destitute of authority, and are so full of mistakes, that it is high time they were omitted in the editions of the Bible. They are no part of the inspired writings but are of the nature of notes and comments, and are constantly doing something, perhaps much, to perpetuate error. The opinion that Timothy and Titus were prelatical bishops, the one of Ephesus and the other of Crete, depends far more on these worthless subscriptions than on anything in the epistles themselves. Indeed, there is no evidence of it in the epistles, and, if these subscriptions were removed, no man from the New Testament would ever suppose that they sustained that office at all. Fortunately the subscriptions finally have been removed from modern versions of the NT, but the error they promulgated dies hard. Timothy and Titus were sent to churches on temporary missions by the Apostle Paul to instruct the believers and to warn them against false teachers. Since virtually all Bible scholars agree that these three letters are from the same period and by the same hand, we will handle their authorship and authenticity as a unit. 2. Authorship of these epistles Until 1804, when Schmidt denied that Paul wrote these epistles, the entire church and even non-believers accepted them as genuine letters of the great apostle. Since that time it has grown ever more common to label these books as forgeries, though pious ones, as if fraud could go with true piety. Most liberals and some otherwise conservative people have trouble accepting the books as genuinely Pauline or at least totally so. Since there is much important teaching on how to guide a church and other important doctrines, including warnings against heretics and unbelief in the latter days, we feel it is necessary to give more detail on these epistles' authenticity than any others except 2 Peter. 3. External Evidence The external evidence for the pastorals is very strong. In fact, if this were the only criterion for acceptance or rejection, they would win without question. Irenaeus is the first known author to quote these epistles directly. Tertullian and Clement of Alexandria ascribed them to Paul, as did the Muratorian canon. Earlier fathers who seem to have known the letters include Polycarp and Clement of Rome. Marcion did not include these three books in his canon, according to Tertullian. This is probably not really a vote against their authenticity as much as against their contents. Marcion was the sort of cult leader to chafe under Paul's harsh attacks against incipient Gnosticism, see Introduction to Colossians, included in the Pastoral Epistles. Passages which this anti-Semitic heretic would especially dislike include 1 Timothy 1 verse 8, 4 verse 3, 6 verse 20 and 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. 
4. Internal Evidence Nearly all the attacks against Paul's having written the pastoral epistles are based on supposed evidence to the contrary within the letters themselves. Three main lines of evidence are alleged, historical, ecclesiastical, and linguistic. We will briefly examine and explain each of these three problems. The Historical Problem Several events and people in these books cannot be fitted into Acts or our knowledge of Paul's ministry from the other epistles. Paul's leaving Trophimus sick at Miletus and his cloak and parchments at Troas do not fit in with his known travels. This is an easy argument to refute. Yes, it is true they don't fit in with Acts, they don't need to. Philippians 1 verse 25 suggests Paul was expecting to be released, and Christian tradition says that he was, and ministered for some years before he was re-imprisoned and beheaded. The events, friends, and enemies mentioned in the pastorals are thus from this period of missionary work between the two imprisonments. The Ecclesiastical Problem It is said that the church organization is too late for Paul, 2nd century, in fact. While it is true that bishops, elders, and deacons are discussed in the pastorals, there is no evidence they were the monarchical type of bishops of the second and following centuries. In fact, Philippians 1 verse 1, an earlier epistle, mentions a plurality of bishops, overseers, in one church, not one bishop over a church, or the even later system of one bishop over several churches. Also, the words elders and bishops are used interchangeably in Timothy and Titus, whereas, starting in the second century, with persistent encouragement from Ignatius, one bishop was singled out to be over the other men as presbyters. The very basic teaching on church leaders thus clearly suggests the apostolic age, not the second century. The Linguistic Argument The strongest attack is based on the difference in style and vocabulary between these three letters and the other ten we accept as by Paul. Some of Paul's favorite words and expressions are not found here, and many words not used in his other letters are 36% new words. Statistical methodology is made to prove Paul couldn't have written these letters. The same method has challenged poems by Shakespeare with similar negative results. It is well to acknowledge that there are actual problems here. For once the theories are not almost completely based on prejudice against unpalatable scriptural doctrine. However, the latter-day apostates who are attacked in the pastorals do sound surprisingly like some of the very scholars who insist Paul is not the author of them. First of all, it is important to remember that these are the letters of an old man facing death one who has had much broadening travel and acquired many new friends since getting out of prison, 2 Timothy is written from his second imprisonment. Everyone increases his vocabulary as he ages, reads, travels, and mixes with new people. Second, we must realize the subject matter of these letters, church officers, ethics, and apostasy automatically calls for new words. These epistles are also far too short for a fair use of the statistical method. Perhaps most significantly, 80% of the NT vocabulary occurring only in the pastorals is found in the Greek OT, LXX, as Guthrie states in his introduction. Since Paul was ministering in Greek, it is obvious he knew the OT scriptures in that language as well as in the Hebrew original. In short, these words which Paul is alleged to have used were at least part of his recognition vocabulary. The church fathers who used Greek as their everyday language saw no problem in Pauline authorship of the pastorals. The fact that some did so for Hebrews shows they were sensitive to a writer's style. Putting all the answers to the arguments together, and especially when joined with the ancient and universal acceptance by Orthodox believers of these letters as from Paul's own hand, we also can accept them as such with a good conscience. In fact, the highly ethical content of these epistles rules out a forger, pious, or otherwise. These are the inspired words of God, 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17, communicated through the Apostle Paul. V. Background and Themes of the Pastoral Epistles Frankly, we do not have too much background for the period of Paul's life covered by these epistles. The best we can do is to piece together the biographical statements which are found in the letters themselves, and these are very sketchy. There are several words and themes which recur frequently in these letters. These give us an insight into the subjects which occupied Paul's mind increasingly as his ministry was drawing to a close. Faith is one of the characteristic words. As the peril of apostasy increased, 
Paul sought to emphasize the great body of Christian doctrine which had been delivered to the saints. He described various attitudes which men had taken or would take toward faith. 1. Some suffered shipwreck concerning the faith, 1 Timothy 1 verse 19. 2. Some would depart from the faith, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. 3. Some would deny the faith, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. 4. Some would cast off their first faith, 1 Timothy 5 verse 12. 5. Some would stray from the faith, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. 6. Some missed the mark concerning the faith, 1 Timothy 6 verse 21. Clearly related is the expression sound doctrine. Sound here means more than correct or orthodox. It means healthy or health-giving. It is the word from which hygiene comes. Here, of course, it is spiritual hygiene. Note the following. Sound doctrine, 1 Timothy 1 verse 10, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, Titus 1 verse 9, 2 verse 1. Wholesome words, 1 Timothy 6 verse 3. Sound words, 2 Timothy 1 verse 13. Sound in the faith, Titus 1 verse 13, 2 verse 2. Sound speech, Titus 2 verse 8. The word conscience is mentioned six times, as follows. 1 Timothy 1 verses 5 and 19, 3 verse 9, 4 verse 2. 2 Timothy 1 verse 3. Titus 1 verse 15. Godliness is emphasized as the practical proof of the soundness of one's doctrine, 1 Timothy 2 verses 2 and 10, 3 verse 16, 4 verses 7, 8, 5 verse 4, 6 verses 3, 5, 6, 11, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, outward form of godliness only, 3 verse 12, Titus 1 verse 1, 2 verse 12. Being sober or sober-minded are qualities which the apostle felt were worthy of cultivation by his young assistants, 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 and 15, 5 verses 6, 8, 2 Timothy 3 verses 2 and 11, Titus 1 verse 8, 2 verses 2, 4, 6, 12. We should notice, too, the many good things which the Apostle mentions. Good conscience, 1 Timothy 1 verses 5 and 19. The law is good, 1 Timothy 1 verse 8. A good warfare, 1 Timothy 1 verse 18. Prayer is good, 1 Timothy 2 verse 3. Good works, 1 Timothy 2 verse 10, 3 verse 1, 5 verses 10, 25, 6 verse 18. 2 Timothy 2 verse 21, 3 verse 17, Titus 1 verse 16, 2 verses 7, 14, 3 verses 1, 8, 14. Good behavior, 1 Timothy 3 verse 2. Good testimony, 1 Timothy 3 verse 7. A good standing, 1 Timothy 3 verse 13. Every creature is good, 1 Timothy 4 verse 4. A good minister, 1 Timothy 4 verse 6. Good doctrine, 1 Timothy 4 verse 6. Piety is good, 1 Timothy 5 verse 4. The good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6 verse 12, 2 Timothy 4 verse 7. Good confession, 1 Timothy 6 verse 13. Good foundation, 1 Timothy 6 verse 19. Good thing, 2 Timothy 1 verse 14, Titus 2 verse 3, 3 verse 8. A good soldier, 2 Timothy 2 verse 3. Good people, 2 Timothy 3 verse 3, Titus 1 verse 8, 2 verse 5. Good fidelity, Titus 2 verse 10. A final interesting word study concerns the medical terms which are found in these letters. Some think that this is a reflection of the fact that Dr. Luke was a close companion of Paul at this time. We have already mentioned that the word sound means health-giving and is used to describe doctrine, words, speech, and faith. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 2, Paul speaks of a seared conscience. Seared means cauterized as with a hot instrument. The expression obsessed with disputes means sick about them and refers to mental illness, 1 Timothy 6 verse 4. Cancer in 2 Timothy 2 verse 17 is translated gangrene in the Revised Version, the Greek word is the origin of this latter. Itching ears, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, is a final expression used by Paul in his diagnosis of these latter-day clinical cases. 
With this background, let us now turn to the first epistle to Timothy for a verse-by-verse -verse study of its contents.